Hello and welcome back. Recall last time we uh, not only described how GPS works mathematically, we went ahead and presented some error budgets. And those showed that under normal conditions, nominal conditions, a standalone GPS receiver operating by itself with no aiding other than the normal signals from GPS could provide an accuracy of five to 10 meters. It depended a little bit on whether we were talking about vertical accuracy or horizontal. It depended a little bit on what was true about the quality of the receiver and the activity of the ionosphere. What we're gonna do this time in snippet 2.6 is dig into one of the most powerful techniques for improving that accuracy. The way I have it analyzed is modest. We're talking about going from 10 meter accuracy down to around one meter accuracy. But in fact, people have used this concept to get down to one decimeter and even better. So here's our outline beginning with 2.6 differential GPS, which is gonna be a mathematical description of how differential GPS works. So let's start with that. Here's a nice block diagram and we have here, up in the sky, the satellite. Perhaps I should add a couple of solar panels just to give it a little bit more of a realistic view, but hopefully you get the idea. And as you know, it's broadcasting information that describes its own location. And we have that described here as this vector, X of K, super K for the Kth satellite. Presumably we have eight, nine, or 10 in view. And then within that, the three dimensions, x, k, y, k, z, k. It also has a clock offset, so if we felt like it, we could describe it with a four vector rather than a three vector, but this will suffice for us. And here we have the user, which in differential GPS parlance we call the rover. So that's you or I wandering around the countryside trying to find out where we are. And so the unknown there is X sub U, X, U, Y, U, Z, U, three dimensions of position, all of which we would like to estimate. Now, the big difference in differential GPS, and this is really de the defining difference, is that somewhere in our neighborhood, maybe a mile away, maybe a hundred miles away, maybe a thousand miles away, is a reference receiver. And so that's this object here, <clears throat> shown with a dome a antenna on top of a building, let's say. And this is a second GPS receiver. The thing that's special about it is we can call it a reference because it's at a known reference location, and that location is XR, which we've once again broken into the three uh, components of position, XR, YR, ZR. <clears throat> so, the goal of differential GPS is not to go directly f f for the location of XU, but to instead solve for where XU is relative to XR. Now that's tantamount to absolute position because the location of XR is known and we would write XU is equal to XR plus delta XU to R and that's this vector right here. So it's this delta x vector that's shown here in red. So um, I hope that, hope that makes sense. The goal is the same as always, to figure out where x u is. But in this case, we do have this reference receiver and the question asked and answered by differential GPS is how helpful is that? Let's take a look at the math. Here we have it. Uh, what we show at the top is something you've seen before. That's the mathematics associated with standalone GPS. So we'll just put here the label standalone. What you see at the bottom is the math associated with differential GPS, DGPS. In both cases, the user is making a measurement of the pseudo range. And here we have that for the standalone. Recall our mathematics, tau sub u, the pseudo range uh, measured by u, and we can say to the kth 
satellite, just to be a little bit more complete, we'll put the superscript up there, is equal to the distance between the case satellite and the user. So we've notated that with the, the norm of the vector difference between xk and xu. In addition, we do pick up some error due to the ionosphere, some delay due to troposphere, the user clock offset, and we've spoken about that at some length, the fact that the pseudo range differs from the true range, mostly by virtue of this clock offset that's added in. If the satellite isn't perfectly synchronized to GPS time, we do have an error, we call that B, capital B, capital B to denote satellite clock rather than user clock. And also we have the subscript K, sorry, superscript K, to say it's associated with the Kth satellite. <clears throat> In addition, the measured pseudo range has various other errors associated with it, and we aggregate those into the symbol nu. Remember, in the case of standalone GPS, we had the pseudo range, PR, and then based on calculations, we also had a thing we called the Theo range. Theo range. <clears throat> and that is the pseudo range measurement we would expect, in theory, based on the broadcast location of the satellite, minus our best guess of where the user is, plus our best estimate of the Hyano, best estimate of Tropo, our last or current estimate of the user clock offset, and then the satellite clock offset according to its broadcast. So we used the difference of these two quantities, the pseudo range, which is a measurement, and the Theo range, which is a calculation, to form a thing called the residual. The beauty of that is that when we went ahead and did that, please look back a few snippets if, if you don't remember this, that the unknown of interest, delta x, the vector that con connects the reference location to the rover location, now appears on the right-hand side of the equation, but in a linear form rather than a nonlinear form. In fact, delta x is dotted on to the unity length line of sight vector from the user to the satellite, just like the estimanda of interest uh, we'll see here in a moment for differential GPS. <clears throat> we also have an error term here. This is the difference, or due to the difference, between the true location of the satellite and the broadcast location of the satellite. So it appears in a similar form to the estimanda, but this, we hope, is a small number, that the length of lowercase delta xk is maybe only one or two meters long. <clears throat> Here's the difference between the uh, pseudo range clock offset for the user contained in the pseudo range measurement and our last best estimate of it. So this term is similar to this in that it contains things that we have to estimate using a bank of some eight or nine of these pseudo range residuals. Here's the error in the satellite clock offset. Here's the error in the IONO estimate, error in TROPO, and the other measurement errors. So all of this we've looked at before. That is the navigation equation for one of the satellites used in standalone GPS. Differential GPS is very similar. Here's the same pseudo range measurement, identical in every way. <clears throat> I'll put the superscript K there to just make it uh, uh, really identical to what we have for standalone. And the difference is that in differential GPS, you can think of that as being mathematically that operation which replaces the Theo range measurement with a second pseudo range measurement, that being the one taken at the reference receiver. So this is pseudo range R, whereas this is pseudo range U. Once again, I'll put the superscript K here just to make things super clear. 
And you may ask, well, what's the good of that? <clears throat> Remember that the Theo range for standalone just contained our previous guesses for XU and BU, whereas this now contains actual uh, XR and BR, which are known by virtue of the fact that we know where the reference receiver is. So if we go ahead and take the difference, just like we did for standalone, this now becomes our fundamental measurement in the case of differential GPS. It's the differential range. And so we write that as TU minus TR. Once again, I'll add the superscripts here. And it's equal to the difference in these two distances, the difference in the two ionos, the difference in the two tropos, the difference in the two clock offsets, and we obliterate the satellite clock offset because that's common to both measurement, the one at the user and the one at the reference receiver. Uh, but we do have noise coming from both sources. After all, these are two measurements. Neither tau UK or tau RK are calculated based on numbers. So let's press ahead with this equation at the bottom and we'll discover that it's analyzable in exactly the same fashion as we did for the standalone GPS. However, now delta I is the difference in the IONO as experienced at user and reference, so there's no modeling involved. Delta T, same, and the difference in the noise here appears also. So keep an eye on all of this and we'll see how it develops. What we'll do on the next page is start with this equation and just go ahead and write the linearized navigation equation for a set of k such differences. At the top, <coughs> we do the math for the difference in the length of two vectors. The principal thing that we uh, leverage here, I'm going to hop back a few view graphs just to show you, is that these two vectors are nearly parallel. Now you might say, Professor, they don't look parallel to me, but that's just an artifact of this drawing. In fact, the satellite is some 20,000 kilometers away from the reference and the user, and they might only be 100 kilometers apart from each other. So when you put the actual numbers there, uh, the sensibility of assuming that that vector and that vector are nearly parallel comes through. And what that means is we can just look at the projection of one onto the other and do a calculation for the difference in their lengths. It's the exact same mathematical operation we used for standalone. That's what appears here at the top. Here's our equation from the last page. And so we now take this result and we, we replace this difference with this, and that's what appears here. We also write delta I, delta T, delta B, U, R to remind ourselves we're no longer solving for the user clock offset relative to GPS time, but we're now solving for the user clock offset relative to the reference station time. So that's an important thing to be aware of. And here we have delta nu mu r, the difference in the two random noises. With those observations, with those improvements to the equation, we can now once again write a linearized set of equations. And we write the differential range for satellite one here straight down to satellite capital K. Capital K is the 8, 9, or 10 for the number of satellites in view. <clears throat> we can now re write uh, this as being equal to a capital G. Capital G is the exact same geometry matrix we had for standalone. Times the estimanda, which are now delta X, delta Y, delta Z, and delta B which we have to be a little bit aware of because that means when we solve for this set of equations, our answers are all going to be user location relative to the reference. 
And here we have delta I, delta T, and delta nu. Our earnest hope is that the reference receiver and the user receiver are close enough to each other that those deltas are small. That the ray going from the satellite to the user is more or less going through the same iono and the same tropo as the ray from the satellite to the reference. So that just cancels. We're hoping that these are approximately zero. And then we do have the differences in the, the random noises. This can be a more tricky business because if it's multipath, let's say that's really driving this final term here way out on the right, that's not common mode from the user to the receiver. So we have implemented differential GPS to annihilate the errors which are common reference to rover. There's a little bit of risk because it does increase the amount of random noise so we have to make sure we've done other things in our system, both for the roving receiver and the reference receiver to keep those random noises small. That's it for our mathematical introduction. Uh, when we get together next time, we'll talk about the error budget that results. So I look forward to talking to you then.